So yes, as Manoy has just put in the chat box, we're now on page 95 and it's a new chapter. Last week we had uh, the last little paragraph of the section on wise friendship, or I think it said proper, good friendship, good friendship. Um, and we had a whole hour and a half on a couple of paragraphs, which was quite rich and beautiful. And it was talking about the people that we associate with. This week, we're on the chapter called One's Own Good and the Good of Others. And this extends uh, the friendship that we might be having with one another to the way we relate to a whole community, a group of people, and our impact on them. So I won't read much from the introduction because you can read it yourselves, but I thought that the Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi made a really beautiful point here um, about the first couple of texts by pointing out that the first one distinguishes the wise person and the fool, sometimes called the bad person, which is not a value judgment, but it's more um, talking about conduct that's unskillful. So at first they distinguished by their own conduct and their own qualities. And then in the second text, it distinguishes the, the bad person and the good person on the basis of their respective impacts on others. So that's quite interesting, isn't it? That it's not only our own qualities and conduct that's important, but also our impact on others. And I know there's a big kind of dialogue, debate, discussion around intention versus impact. And some people say, well, you know, I didn't mean anything. You know, my intention was good. But I think it's interesting that here the Buddha's pointing to impact as well and, and helping us to take care of that. So... Um, the first one is a fairly small paragraph. The second one's quite long. So we'll just see where we go because it's not so much about getting through content as bringing it into our lives in a relevant way and being able to discuss it um, in a way that means something to us. So I would really welcome questions, comments, sharings, criticisms, doubts, whatever it is that you may have. Um, to be raised because it's very helpful for other people too to get more clarity around how this may be relevant for them. Um, I often find these sort of classes or discussions really, really um, elucidating because every single person has a slightly different take and brings to uh, to mind a slightly different nuance in the suttas that maybe I might have skirted over too quickly. So um, I'll be asking for questions. You can raise your virtual hands. Uh, do you still have those things? I don't see one on my screen, but you ought to have one at the bottom of your screen. Otherwise, if you feel shy to speak, your voice only will be recorded, not your face. But if you feel shy, then you can, um, or for any other reason, you can write in the chat box instead and I'll read it out. Okay. All right. So if you're seated comfortably, then we shall begin. <laughs> This one is called The Fool and the Wise Person. So I'll use the word monastics in this one instead of monks, but of course it relates to anybody. The law of nature is the law of nature. Monastics, one who possesses three qualities, should be known as a fool. What three? Bodily misconduct, verbal misconduct, and mental misconduct. One who possesses these three qualities should be known as a fool. One who possesses three qualities should be known as a wise person. What three? Bodily good conduct, verbal good conduct, and mental good conduct. One who possesses these three qualities should be known as a wise person. So it seems straightforward, right? Seems pretty straightforward, but the thing that stands out to me straight away is that it's talking about all of those three, not only one of them, not only two of them, but all three, which uh, contrasts a little bit to um, some suttas where the Buddha is asking us to overcome anger by focusing on somebody's ver good verbal conduct, for example. Maybe their bodily conduct is, is very impure, but their verbal conduct is good. And one way of overcoming anger towards them or resentment is to focus on the part that is good. But here it's making a definition. So we're not saying that person is necessarily a wise person, just that there are some qualities in them. But here it's saying they're only really known as wise when they have all three. And I guess that doesn't mean 
that you have to be perfect, right? But I think it's meaning that we're generally on the side of skillfulness, of wholesomeness, of um, thoughts, words, and, and deeds that generally conduce to one's own good in this case. And of course, we're not also saying that we have to label someone a fool. We're just saying we should know that they're not a wise person, right? And in that way, perhaps we can uh, use our discernment to avoid difficult situations which could bring ourselves harm. So it's not about judging any others because that would go against other places in the text where the Buddha says, do not um, criticize a person, but you know, criticize their behavior or their bad conduct. Yeah. So <clears throat> he continues further, <clears throat> excuse me. Whatever perils arise, all arise on account of the fool, not on account of the wise person. Hmm. Makes me think of politics somehow. <laughs> Whatever calamities arise, all arise on account of the fool, not on account of the wise person. Whatever misfortunes arise, all arise on account of the fool, not on account of the wise person. Just as a fire that starts in a house made of reeds or grass burns down even a house with a peaked roof, plastered inside and out, so too, whatever perils arise, all arise on account of the fool, not account, on account of the wise person. Whatever calamities arise, whatever misfortunes arise, all arise on account of the fool, not on account of the wise person. Thus the fool brings peril, the wise person brings no peril. The fool brings calamity, the wise person brings no calamity. The fool brings misfortune, the wise person brings no misfortune. There's no peril for the wise person. There's no calamity from the wise person. Oh, sorry, from, both are from. There's no peril from the wise person. There's no calamity from the wise person. And there's no misfortune from the wise person. That suggests that they're very safe to be with. We can really trust them. Therefore, monks or monastics, you should train yourselves thus. We will avoid the three qualities that make one known as a fool. And we will undertake and practice the three qualities that make one known as a wise person. It is in this way that you should train yourself. So once again, this is giving the reason why and the reason why it might be helpful sometimes to differentiate between the wise person and the fool. Again, it's not to judge a person, but it's so that we don't suffer, basically, right? Because the Buddha's whole concern is with suffering and the end of suffering. And obviously he's pointing out where we suffer in order to show us a way out, a way out that's through the suffering by understanding it and then being able to learn how to handle that wisely in ways that lessen it and even eventually uproot that suffering once and for all. So it immediately, again, shows a different nuance, doesn't it, to the wise friendship, you know, that uh, if you're around a good person, there'll be no peril, no calamity, no misfortune for you as a result of that association. That's pretty powerful stuff. Doesn't mean you'll always like what they say or, <laughs> you know, you might have a teacher who tells you to do things you really don't want to do, like uh, I won't say. <laughs> no, no, no. My heart is in this. <laughs> but, you know, a, a good teacher also sometimes challenges you and pushes you to the edge of what you think you can manage, you know, or what you think you can um, row through. Um, so it doesn't necessarily mean peril, calamity or misfortune in the way of, you know, not enjoying something or, you know, meeting challenges. But I guess it's meaning more in terms of like a disaster that might happen uh, on account of that association. You know, like so many things can happen, can't they, in relationships? We can be betrayed or, you know, we can be misrepresented or... <clears throat> simply by associating with the wrong people we can start to pick up some of their bad habits etc etc and for that reason we should train ourselves to avoid those qualities that make oneself known as a fool right 
for the mate oneself known as a wise because obviously we don't want to have that effect on others either we want people who come in contact with us not to suffer misfortune calamity or peril very kind of old-fashioned words but <laughs> sort of strong words yeah and i guess another warning isn't it of the dangers in wrong association you know again look at what happens when the wrong leaders take control of whole areas of this world you know it just brings so much true calamity you know and it's happening now and it's probably always been happening somewhere in the world sometimes not so high profile but always there nevertheless so that's the first little sutta and um It'd be interesting to hear if you, oh, the other bit that might we might just emphasize here before I do open for any comments or questions is this little simile. Maybe we could think a bit more about this. Um, so the simile is where the Buddha is saying that all perils arise on the account of the fool, not the wise. All calamities and all misfortunes arise on account of the fool and not the wise. Just as a fire that starts in a house made of reeds or grass, burns down even a house with a peaked roof, plastered inside and out. Hmm. So even if it's a really strong house, and, and even these days in Buddhist countries or Buddhist monasteries, you can see these beautiful Dhamma halls with peaked roofs. There was actually such a beautiful Dhamma hall in um, a monastery in, uh, I think it's in New South Wales, um, you know when you know that you're going to forget the name of it just before you do forget the name of it <laughs> oh what but a dhamma that's the name and they have this incredible dhamma hall sort of built a bit like a boat and it's got a peaked roof and a fire did come the fire was not just made of reeds or grass it was made of you know eucalyptus trees etc and um it kind of ripped through that monastery but actually the peaked roof stayed intact but here it's saying even such a strong building can be destroyed. So sometimes I know for myself, sometimes I felt almost invincible, you know, sort of so kind of secure and solid in the Dhamma that nothing can really hurt me. And I've missed the signs, you know, that a relationship's going off track. I felt like, oh, it's OK. You know, they just shouted at me a little bit. I can handle it. I'm economist. <laughs> and then it becomes insidious, doesn't it? And we can suddenly find ourselves, you know, really worn down to a place it's not always easy to get back from. So it's a sort of warning for us again, I think. Anyway, before I continue talking too much, I would like to uh, ask for any comments or experiences or things you might like to share reflections on the texts it's a pretty straightforward one so oh here we go nikki hiya hi hi yeah um i thought you might you've had might have had a menopause moment then <laughs> it made me laugh when you forgot the name of something uh, anyway. <laughs> i just thought oh is that a menopause moment thank you for excusing me <laughs> Well, do you know this um this whole passage really, really do you know i've got a strong vision i used to work in a treatment center for ad addiction so if i think about somebody coming in with addiction and then the process of this passage it's really beautiful it's like bodily good conduct verbal good conduct and mental none of that was happening <laughs> initially but they had even in this even the way it's wrote i think it's like even in that process of the the bodily um good conduct have to come from them not using drugs that was their bodily you know they had to do that they had to do that and then the that verbal good conduct might have come in you know as a more refined the mental good conduct was more refined there's like a refinement here yeah. but they also had to stay away from uh, you know addicts they can't be around addicts but there's a really nice saying that used to go around if you sit in a barber's shop long enough you'll get a haircut and that's what they used to say and it was so like they knew that you know if you hang out with those if you sit around there long enough you think you're all right eventually you'll get that haircut so that's what it reminded me of it reminded me of that process of watching them so yeah oh, thanks a lot that's such a brilliant real life example Mm. And I really like, you know, that you pointed out that 
development, you know, uh, from first of all curbing the grosser misconduct at the level of the body, and then that starts to transform the speech and then eventually the mind. Yeah. Yeah. yeah beautiful. The sila comes in, isn't it? Lovely. <coughs> Should we come to Shirley? Hi. Hello. I hope you can hear me because I just couldn't hear you just now. You faded away. I don't know whether I do that from time to time. Um, yes. I mean, I hope you do fade away. You Thank know, you. In the spiritual sense, <laughs> even though you've so. been with us for a long time. <laughs> yeah. That's the nicest wish anybody's made for me. All <laughs> but I want to hear your voice. You see. <laughs> Thank you, Nikki, for those reflections. I'm coming from a sort of opposite tack, where I've been in a lot of group situations with good people, Dharma practitioners, and people have got deeply, deeply hurt. Um, and there's been good intention, but there's been... And, uh, you know, they are, they are good people trying to, to uh, and yet there can sometimes be these conflicts where people get deeply hurt. And I've been in some situations where it's actually taken years. Um, but things do heal. And I think the reason, I think, and I'm just sort of trying to tease out the qualities that you need to let these difficulties heal. Um, I think there has to be humility that you may have made a mistake because you've hurt somebody because you've been un unaware of um, their um, sensitive areas or you've um, disagreed with them and pushed your point of view without listening to theirs. Um, and I think, but I think there has to be, I think here the mental, the mental sort of quality of meta and forgiveness yeah. and also willingness to acknowledge one's mistakes. Yeah. And I think for there to be healing, there has to be that on, on both sides when there are these awful, um, these, you know, I've been through a couple of really awful sort of situations in 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 Dhamma groups, and it's horrible. And people sort of think this shouldn't happen because these are good people. But um, you know, it's easy to take offence, and it's easy to give offence, and it's sort of this. I suppose I'm just sort of contemplating aloud, uh, how, you know, how that you know even good people there can be these. Yeah. these conflicts mm -hmm. and you know and you can't really avoid them happening because we're human right. yeah, um, right. but mm -hmm. I think it's this uh, it's this it's a sort of I'm sort of thinking aloud but this humility this mm -hmm. this this sort of uh, w willingness to v forgive and it can actually take it can actually take a long time for these things to heal. So it's just a little so we are from the opposite side of Nikki. We were dealing with drug addicts and people who are really sort of enmeshed in sort of great suffering. You know, good people can also, yeah. you know. Anyway, I'll, yeah, I'll stop yeah. Wittering. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's a good it's a good point because you're saying in a sense that you know even when we do have good conduct of body speech and mind um we can still cause harm to others and of course that's the case so long as you know even the buddha i mean people thought that he'd caused harm to them i'm sure he you know didn't actually but you know people can get offended and i think it's mainly because we still have a sense of self so although the metta can be a healing way to come over that and the forgiveness is indispensable perhaps if we had more in the beginning you know if that was the central point of our practice we might not get so hurt in the first place because it's really the sense of self, isn't it, that's getting hurt, I think. Um, but at the same time, it could be that there are areas of our mental conduct that we haven't seen clearly enough. You know, maybe they are practicing really well at the verbal and bodily level and they don't mean harm. But like you said, you know, maybe there's not enough sensitivity or there's just, yeah, intentions in there that are mixed, perhaps. And yeah, I mean... We can only do what we can do, but we're bound to hurt one another in life. Yeah. 
We, um, can I just do one from the box? Because I'm aware that they end up coming last and then we'll come to Diana. Okay. <clears throat> um, what are some examples of mental misconduct? Are anger and fear one of them? Okay. So I've seen a few um, questions in the box. So yeah, uh, mental misconduct, I think, is easier to work out by its effect on oneself, in a sense, like we sort of can tell in a way when we're thinking in a way that's causing suffering or um, anger and fear are definitely, uh, you know, not wholesome states of mind, not states of mind in which you can also be feeling peaceful. They don't coexist with peace and happiness. Um, and I guess the reason it can be seen as a misconduct is if that does then, yeah, cause you suffering, but also lead to maybe making decisions based on fear or, you know, speaking out of anger to another person. Um, I mean, that's something I often take to heart when I've got to make decisions. It's like, am I making this decision out of fear? As in, am I making it? out of fear but also am I not making something out of fear like am I choosing not to do something that would be wholesome out of fear um so it's kind of subtler but mental misconduct is really anything that's not aligned with the three right intentions which are like the intentions of letting go non-control so you know you could say control possessiveness um you know selfishness is an example of mental misconduct um and then loving kindness is the right mental disposition mental conduct so anything that's angry or hateful resentful and then the last one is like uh, gentleness kindness compassion so anything that's a little bit cruel or violent towards oneself one of my guests was saying this morning sometimes they notice that uh, they feel like uh, i shouldn't be having this emotion you know i shouldn't be having it it's wrong for me to have it and uh, you know or i don't like this tiredness i wanted to go away and, and noticing that in a way that's quite cruel to oneself to think that way because that thing has arisen and it's there seeking our attention seeking our care so i mean in brief anything that's leading you into more suffering and that's leading away from peace yeah uh okay we'll come to diana now diana can you unmove please I'm glad you went to the box because um, you had just said to Shirley, can you hear me? Yeah, perfectly. You had just said to Shirley, um, you know, maybe at the mental level, and I knew that question was in the box. So, um, and this kind of relates to it too, because one thing that stands out to me from this passage is the metaphor. I'm glad you read it a second time. Um, I thought of you when I read it, actually. Really? <laughs> yeah, because I know you like to pick up on those nuances. Yeah. Yeah. And um, thanks. <laughs> and um, yeah, just as a fire that starts in a house made of reeds or grass burns down even a house with a peaked roof plastered inside and out because the core is flammable. It's not built of bricks and then plastered with a peaked roof. It's built of reeds and grass. And to me, that could kind of represent the mental level, like a person that looks good on the outside, very spiritual, or this aura, or maybe their speech is beautiful, like they present well, but, and it could be about ourselves as well, you know, but that whole kind of spiritual bypass concept might play in here like it's what's inside that counts and also like going could you use to say mind matters most mm -hmm. so um at first i thought of the three little pigs but then i realized it was a little deeper <laughs> what, the three little pigs the three little pigs is the story of the three little pigs who um each built a house one made it of sticks Gosh, maybe one made it of grass, one made it of sticks, and one made it of brick. And then the big bad wolf came and huffed That's and puffed. Right. And I'll blow your house in, and only the brick house oh, yeah. remained. <clears throat> so that's what I thought at first. But the idea that it's plastered and made to look nice, 
Yeah. See, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's a really nice nuance. Yeah, plastered. You know, sometimes I actually think that here, <laughs> I shouldn't criticize the place because it's wonderful and it's a great start to a place. But one of the things I notice is it's all really nice on the outside, but it's not built the way old houses used to be. So it's mm. far less soundproofed and like things chip off quite easily and things like that. And it kind of reminds me that sometimes people yeah it can be like that like you say looking good on the outside but then when you dig a bit deeper there's something there that's been missed or something there that's yet to be cultivated yeah 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 that's wonderful i love your insight into these things <clears throat> it's beautiful thank you we can really um it's amazing just how many different ways the sitters can speak to us So I'll come to the box again. How do I distinguish a teacher with wholesome diagnostic tools from someone who is delusional, maybe? Appropriate judgment. Hmm. So I'm not sure what you mean quite by wholesome diagnostic tools. Um, do you mean that you have the wholesome diagnostic tools? Maybe that's what you mean. A teacher from someone who's delusional um and definitely appropriate judgment and discernment but i would also say it takes a very long time sometimes i mean for me it's very quick to see the delusional usually and i would say a real red flag is anybody who kind of claims to have a certain state especially if they're claiming enlightenment and there's a lot of people like this out there who claim this and and when you actually dig a bit deeper you realize they're not talking about quite the same state that the buddha described you know maybe they still have a sense of self fa fairly strongly or maybe they even get angry and then they say, well, yes, enlightened people do get angry. I hope I'm not saying someone else's name, <laughs> but it's good to be aware, right? Because in there, he's actually saying, well, I'm enlightened and still have anger. They still have lust. And, you know, you've got to be able to measure these things according to what the Buddha's saying about one who's enlightened. The basic premise is the basic kind of uh, qualifier for an enlightened person is they don't have greed, hate, and delusion anymore. Um, so if somebody's displaying anger um, and still, you know, kind of grosser defilements, like maybe not being able to be faithful to their partner, then you can be absolutely sure that that's delusional. Um, there are many, many states of mind we can access through all kinds of means, even through you know, drugs or hallucinogenics and stuff like this, but they don't give the same results as meditation. And in fact, they may even contribute to more delusion because they're distorting the truth. You know, they're creating experiences that are not real. That's why they're called hallucinogenics. It's a hallucination. So even though it might look similar to the real thing, to people who aren't very familiar with the difference, they don't have the ethical foundation so yeah first of all someone with very strong ethics as well very very strong ethics virtue it should be much better than one's own ideally or at least as good to qualify as someone who can teach you so always look for what someone does and says rather than um sorry what they do rather than what they say mm. yeah see if the two match and you know it might not be perfect it won't be perfect in anyone who's not yet enlightened but there should be an integrity, a sincerity, an authenticity there. Yeah. You probably, it's easier to feel when something's off than to know whether somebody's actually enlightened. And very few people are. So maybe that's too high a standard to go for. But, you know, trust your instinct on that. Because as it says here, you know, the peril, the danger is too great, you know, when we associate with the fall. Yeah uh so this person says i can't talk right now but i see it with my 13 year old he's changed schools and he's hanging with a couple of troubled boys and he's acting out my wife and i now have to redirect him from these boys yeah 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 especially because the tendency especially at that age is to try to fit in isn't it to try and belong so if they're kind of cool boys if he thinks they're cool boys then he will actually start acting that way very good that you've noticed it. I hope you have success there and he finds some good friends. <clears throat> Is mental misconduct less serious if verbal and bodily action are correct? I would say it is, yes. I mean, you'll still have some mental suffering, but you won't be causing uh, too much suffering to others. So yes, I think, you know, 
we have to sometimes start with sila with restraining our bodily and verbal behavior and then bit by bit it starts to penetrate deeper inside you know it starts to shift the way we relate to others the way we incline our mind it can work both ways you know i think in in daily life we get a really great opportunity to work with our verbal and bodily action and that will start to shape our the way we think the way we relate but then in meditation retreats they offer a great chance to work a lot with the mind and you'll see as a result of that you'll find your bodily and verbal behavior improves and if it's not improving not instantly perhaps but it should be improving the more you practice because you're you're basically able to catch your mind when it's going off track much sooner and you become much more sensitive to the signs which can be physiological sometimes that that you're thinking in unskillful ways you know for example if you do have anger arising or something going around around your head you've got a lot of restlessness you'll feel that in your body and your body will give you the signal oh my mind is now you know creating tension creating um heat or whatever it is in the body so that mindfulness of the body can really help us to notice our mental behavior and hopefully that will translate into better verbal and bodily conduct yeah but certainly it's not as strong i mean if the mental misconduct is really strong that's when it issues in like very um serious verbal and bodily action like unskillful and harmful but verbal and bodily action gosh there's so many messages coming in and this is just from that little paragraph and i will also just remind the people with me here that if there's anything they wish to contribute they're welcome to you just have to put your hand up <laughs> i'll just read through a few more of these and then come to the people with their hands up on the screen i had flu and a bad chest infection this last month and the body was very tired this affected my daily meditation, etc., through lack of sleep. So it was frustrating to not be able to practice so easily, causing anger. As the body has regained health, the practice has returned. Yeah, yeah, it's good to see, isn't it? Um, <laughs> the causes sometimes for these uh, unwholesome mental states to arise. And again, it's that connection between the mind and the body. Um, funnily enough, we were talking today with one of the guests. I think all of us were saying in the morning that we're really tired and um and then we were sort of talking about how it really affects us and then if you just have a little sleep you're in a, such a better mood <laughs> automatically and all the problems the same problems the same situations just don't affect you in the same way in fact you might even see them from an entirely more positive angle so it's just so interesting to make that connection and then hopefully next time when you're tired and you have a lack of sleep you'll realize that that anger is a is caused by that and you can look after your body a bit better not buy into the anger mm. i really enjoyed listening to shirley's point i wonder if it may be more painful to be hurt by good people who follow the dhamma because we aren't expecting to be hurt and let our guard down then even smaller misconducts may be amplified to hurt us deeper because they defy our expectations this is a good point yeah expectation we're hurt by those we expect to help guide us along the path, making it feel like a betrayal. At least for myself, I notice myself holding tighter to people I judge to be wise than to those I judge to be foolish. Yeah. Since not being able to let go is the core source of suffering, this, of course, ends up being more painful. Mm, thank you for that. Yeah, very insightful comment. Okay. As far as I know, in Theravada Buddhism, it is not allowed to share personal achievements. I like that. Yeah, that's right for monastics. It's also, I feel a little bit distasteful, even when lay people do, actually, because I kind of feel like if they're genuine attainments, they've only resulted from the sense of self being undermined. So if the sense of self has been undermined, why would they then start talking about attainments as personal possessions? so i do find it a bit distasteful and i have come across lay people who go on retreats and then they send an email to everybody on their email list telling all about this day i was in this state and the next day i was in the next state and it's like mm, it just feels to me a little coarse because these things are not i mean it's how to say i mean i don't want to say sacred because it's not sacred because we're not religious but they're so subtle and they have all such a letting go and such a lot of humility. It's like, yeah, 
it's hard to find the language. Um, I mean, I want to say grace, but Adrian Brown tells me off for that because, again, it's very Christian. I don't know if somebody else has a word for that, but it, it feels to me more like, uh, yeah, I just don't have the word. It's not a personal achievement, that's for sure. So, yeah, monastics are forbidden from doing that and for very good reason, because otherwise we might attract more dana than other monastics, which is really not fair because other monastics who are not enlightened probably need it about more, right? <laughs> enlightened people don't mind if there's no chocolate in the evening. <laughs> I'm just kidding. That's a bit of a joke. But basically, we support the Sangha. We don't support individuals. We support the Sangha as a system that the Buddha laid down and that works. We're supporting the renunciation, not the individual. <clears throat> okay, can we come to Tamali? I know your name there is Nayali. That's your daughter. So this is Tamali. Hope you can hear me, Vendramil. Hi. Hi. Um, when you were explaining, you know, um, the mental misconduct, how we can actually feel it in our body. So um, I've noticed, particularly in this week, when I'm experiencing anything um, like fear or a little bit of, say, maybe anger, um, what really helped me, I thought might help others as well. It's just I started just writing it down. So when I'm aware of it, I just started so that um, feeling in the body kind of fades away. So I just take five minutes, um, mainly because there's a bit of um, like deadlines coming up and you have to work on certain things and you're, you feel like, oh, I really have to, you know, kind of do this. And it gets a bit tight. And I thought, OK, let me write it down. And I'm really noticing it's so it's just like um, something that's really helpful. Okay, I thought might be useful. I'll share. Thank you. That's a real live um, applied little tool there that's come through your own experience in life. And I think particularly helpful maybe for people who do have busy jobs and have to continue. I mean, it's a little bit similar to the practice of noting, you know, although I don't do it myself, but I've done a few retreats that way um, where you just notice rather than a whole train of thought, you just you notice anger. Right? Or you notice fear and that kind of objectifies it to a certain point. It's not meant to dissociate from it. It's meant to actually make you aware of it. Um, and it can be a way to start to undermine those defilements. Yeah. And it's OK, by the way, to feel a bit angry. It's OK. It's OK to feel very angry. I mean, anger is so stigmatized. What's not OK is to, you know, to um, throw that anger on other people. So by addressing it within yourself. That's a skillful way to, to yeah, curb the defilement from becoming, I don't like the word defilement, curb the anger <laughs> so that it doesn't, you know, adversely impact others. But sometimes it will, and we have to have that forgiveness, right? And that loving kindness and notice, well, you know, I'm having a hard time. Anyone in this situation would feel that way. Yeah. So be compassionate to yourself and to your anger as well. Uh so Shelley says, I like grace. I didn't understand it when I was a Christian, but I feel I do now. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. These things for me are like perceptions sometimes that help. Just perceptions. Another one that helps me is like feeling held. Just imagining that I'm completely held in love or in safety or that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. They're sort of perceptions to me. There's a friend who once told me that it takes time before the dirt comes out in the washing. It's a good way to check teachers and students. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and don't just reject someone who's not perfect. Otherwise, you won't come to my retreats or my <laughs> talks anymore. <laughs> you know, most people are not. And even people who, you know, I have strong confidence in as being very, very far on the path, they have sometimes annoying idiosyncrasies or they'll say unskillful things, sexist jokes or whatever. So don't throw out the baby with the bathwater either. You know, just check whether I think somebody's virtue is a really good place to start. You know, ethical virtue. You don't have to be like a super strict monastic that stops eating bang on 12. And if you eat one minute later, you know, you're bad. But you shouldn't be like shouting at other people or, you know, manipulating or that kind of thing. Um, I don't know if Tamali has more to add. Your hand's still up there. 
Is it? No? Okay. So to add to Tamali's response, I watch my physical changes when negative emotions arise. Anger causes some heat in my head. Then my focus to anger reduces. Yeah. That's great. And it's a great practice to establish because the more you do it, the more you'll notice those physical changes quickly um, and sometimes in quite a lot of detail so that you can actually see them changing there and then. It's fascinating when that happens. It's almost it really undermines <clears throat> it really undermines those um, emotions because as you see, it's dissolving. I mean, there's nothing really to to kind of get your I don't know how to say get traction you know there's no traction there it's it's disappearing before you can respond so yeah very very skillful way to practice <clears throat> excuse me great so if there's nothing else on this point shall we continue by just checking the room anything to yes okay we're all good so We'll start with the next one, and this is a very long one, so no hurry to get through it. And we'll just see what we can draw out. So you don't need to wait for me. If you have a comment to make, you can raise your hand, put something in the box, and I'll come to you as and when. <clears throat> so the first one, as Bhikkhu Bodhi had pointed out, was more about a person's qualities defining them. And this one is more about the impact, what they do. So, the bad person and the good person. Monastics or community, let's say. A bad person is possessed of bad qualities. So really, that is all they are, in a sense, a whole heap of bad qualities, because there's no real person there that's fixed, but it's just to use conventional language for the sake of, you know, clarity and, and simplicity here. So they associate as a bad person. They decide as a bad person. They counsel as a bad person, speak as a bad person and act as a bad person. They hold views as a bad person and give gifts as a bad person. So here we can again elaborate on the bad or the good by the qualities. So yeah, somebody with bad bodily, verbal and mental conduct. So by bad we mean the main motivation being greed, hate, and delusion, right? And then they decide based on that greed, hate, delusion. Counsel with greed, hate, delusion. Speak with greed, hate, delusion. Act, hold views, and give gifts with those um, bad qualities in mind. And how is a person possessed of bad qualities? Okay, so this is more nuanced. Okay, how is a bad person possessed of bad qualities? Here, a bad person has no faith, no shame. I think that's hiri, which I like to translate as moral conscience, actually. No fear of wrongdoing, which I think is uh, otapa, which I would translate as moral caution. <laughs> but anyway, we can have shame and fear. They are unlearned, lazy forgetful and unwise that is how a bad person is possessed of bad qualities and how does a person a bad person associate as a bad person here a bad person has for friends and companions those ascetics and brahmins who have no faith no shame no fear of wrongdoing who are unlearned lazy forgetful and unwise that's how a bad person associates as a bad person. So you know, only have them yourself, but you associate with others who are the same. And how does a bad person decide as a bad person? Here, a bad person decides for their own affliction, for the affliction of others, and for the affliction of both. That is how a bad person decides as a bad person. So that's overtly harmful, isn't it? And how does a bad person counsel as a bad person? Here, a bad person counsels for their own affliction, for the affliction of others, and for the affliction of both. 
That is how a bad person counsels as a bad person. And how does a bad person speak as a bad person? Here, a bad person speaks false speech, divisive speech, harsh speech, and idle chatter. That is how a bad person speaks as a bad person. So you might notice that those five types of wrong speech are one of the definitions of wrong speech. Um, that's elaborated on in a lot of the suttas on the gradual training, like the Majjhima 51 and 125 and other suttas like that. Um, so false, divisive, harsh, idle. Here it doesn't actually say, oh yeah, false, divisive, harsh and idle. Yeah, that's one of them. Idle is sometimes translated as gossip. So just chit chat that's not really getting anywhere and that's maybe increasing delusion, wasting people's time. There's much more on that in those suttas I mentioned, Majjhima 51 and Majjhima Nikaya 125. It's very beautifully described there because it also describes the opposite, the wholesome speech in those terms. And how does a bad person act as a bad person? Here, a bad person destroys life, takes what is not given, and engages in sexual misconduct. This is how a bad person acts as a bad person. Hmm. So that's only three of the five precepts, isn't it? So the stealing, oh yeah, takes what is not given, engages in sexual misconduct. So the alcohol and drugs is missing. And which other one is missing? Lying is missing because we've already covered that in the last one. And I don't really understand why um, the alcohol isn't included here, but it's the case in the gradual training as well that it's not included in the other suttas I mentioned, the 51 or 125. Maybe it's assumed that nobody's doing that. I'm not quite sure. Um, maybe it's not seen as an action in the sense that it's involving another person so much i'm not quite sure but it's absolutely bad action also it's considered a breakage of uh venchanda, uh, venchanda. i'm reading a note at the, at the side that said my name um it's a breakage of sila yes and it would break me as well <laughs> because i'd be a very bad nun so yes uh this is my menopause brain as somebody pointed out so it can be quite amusing you know <sighs> Dear me. Yeah, Diana said maybe it was added later. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, obviously, the five precepts are kind of a compilation of, of different um, uh, qualities, different virtues. And I'm pretty sure it's there in the suttas, but I actually don't remember where they're listed as five. Um, yeah, it could have been added later. Maybe it wasn't such a thing in those days. I don't know. But we could find out. Any Pali scholars? Any Sutta scholars? We have to find out. <laughs> maybe drinking is not the bad thing. Oh, maybe drinking is not the bad thing, but it's the result of when you drink. Hmm. And Diana said maybe it came later in the Buddha's life after monks were misbehaving. Did you have something, Leah? Well, basically, um... if you speak up, they'll hear you. Hopefully. No. Okay. Drink. Yeah. Now, all of these things can arise. Yes, 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 yes. It does. It does. Yeah. So Leah, I don't know if you heard her. She's my guest, but she said that um, when you drink, that can lead to all of these things happening as well, which is really true. Huh? Uh, and Rob says sometimes people get friendlier when they're drunk. <laughs> well. <laughs> Well, I'm not sure it's genuine friendship, but um, <laughs> and it's a bit of a chance to take, huh? But uh, I don't think it's endorsing drinking. <laughs> it's just for some reason not mentioned here. So how does a bad person hold views as a bad person? And I like this one because this one, uh, this one relates to wrong view. And we've covered that earlier for those who've been here with the Sutta class for the last two years or however long it's taken us to get halfway through the book. <laughs> this is a description of wrong view. And how does a bad person hold views as a bad person? Here, a bad person holds such a view as this. 
there is nothing given, nothing offered, nothing sacrificed. No fruit or result of good and bad actions. No this world, no other world. No mother, no father, no beings who are reborn spontaneously. No good and virtuous aesthetics and Brahmins in the world who've realized for themselves by direct knowledge and declare this world and the other world. That is how a bad person holds views as a bad person. So I want to say a little bit on this, which was just one observation I had when I read it, which is um, that it may be the case that a bad person will hold this wrong view, but it's not necessarily the case that anyone who holds this wrong view is a bad person, right? There's an important difference there because until we actually have right view, we may have some of these wrong views, but I think there's a danger there. It's pointing to a danger in those views not leading to anything very wholesome for us. Um, and it sounds a bit cryptic for people who aren't, um, haven't had this sort of explained by good teachers. It can sound a little bit strange. There's nothing given, nothing offered, nothing sacrificed. I think for me, the point of that is like a lack of gratitude not realizing that you know other people are the cause for one's well-being like there are things that we've been given there are things that have come to us as privileges that you know we need to recognize and feel grateful for and and when we recognize our privileges not to feel guilty for them but to think how can i best use what i have for the sake of others you know so if we don't even think we've been given anything we've not had anything offered it's like there can be that arrogance there right I know oh, I deserve it. I, I did it off my own, what do you call it, off my own steam or how you call it. And they don't recognize that, you know, there's this whole societal system supporting you and maybe a lot of privilege there too. There's no fruit or result of good or bad actions. So that's uh, not understanding the law of karma. So you're less likely, less motivated to try to do good, right? Also, maybe. Because to me, it's not necessarily that the result has to be there straight away. But if you're mindful, you can notice that even in the doing of good, there's happiness instantly, actually. So there's certainly a lack of mindfulness if you don't recognize that. There's no this world, no other world. So this is connected to the idea of rebirth, which, again, many people might not, you know, really believe and you're not expected or required to believe it at this stage on the path. But it does point toward that view of rebirth being quite wholesome and potentially leading to a lot of good action. And also, I would say, the importance of keeping an open mind. So there's no mother, no father. Again, a lack of gratitude, perhaps. It could be more than that. Uh, it doesn't mean you have to get along with your mother and father, right? But to recognize that they have gifted you the body, at least. You couldn't have been born alone. <laughs> into the human realm there's no spontaneously born beings here but that there are spontaneously born beings somewhere else who knows who knows i can't claim to have uh, to know that through experience and that there are no good or virtuous ascetics and brahmins in the world who've realized for themselves by direct knowledge and declare this world and the other world so that's a kind of description of someone who's most probably enlightened, but at least has that insight into rebirth here. Realized for themselves by direct knowledge is usually a realization to, into the truth. Um, and so imagine, I don't know, for me, it's quite horrible to imagine a world where there couldn't be that possibility of enlightenment. You know, if nobody in the world had actually managed to experience that, um, you know, or not even to think there might be anyone who has. I know for myself, when I meet people who I have that confidence in, it's an enormous boost on the path because it gives me really something to aspire toward. And I can also see the results of those insights in those people and see the beauty of their bodily and verbal and mental conduct. You know, it's so beautiful and so touching to behold. So, yeah. Again, that it doesn't mean you're a bad person if you don't yet have right view. And this is only preliminary right view. This is the right view at the beginning of the path, just a kind of 
uh, sense of faith, a sense that, yes, there are, act there are results of my actions and of other people's actions. Yes, there are things that have been given and offered to me. There are, um, you know, there are, um, there is a possibility. For me both could be a possibility. Let me keep that inquiry open. Yeah. And that there may be people who've realized the truth that there is such a thing as enlightenment, because I do think, you know, if you don't even believe that, can you really say you're a Buddhist? I mean, what is it that you're practicing toward? You know, there has to be a sort of sense of where this is leading, a sense that freedom from suffering is possible um, in order to ensure that you take the right path toward that goal. You know, that's what right the right view, right intention, right, right, right. It's not like kind of right in a sort of snotty, arrogant way, but it's right in the sense that it's leading to that particular goal. There are other paths, but they don't lead to the same goal. Um, and then the last one, we'll go through the last one and then we'll, uh, it's almost the end of the uh, discussion. We can always discuss it in depth next time. And how does a bad person give gifts as a bad person? And I really like this one because all of us probably do give gifts to people on occasion. And maybe we can look at how we're doing it and improve the effect for ourselves. Here, a bad person gives a gift carelessly, gives it not with their own hand, gives it without showing respect, gives what is to be discarded, gives it with the view that nothing will come of it. Again, that lack of trust in cause and effect. I don't believe in karma. That is how a bad person gives gifts as a bad person. So I'll just read the last tiny little bit because then it will finish the section on a bad person. That bad person, thus possessed of bad qualities, who thus associates as a bad person, decides, counsels, speaks, acts, holds views, and gives gifts as a bad person. On the dissolution of the body after death, they're reborn in the destination of bad people. Wow, we don't want to hang out there. <laughs> and what is the destination of bad people? It is hell or the animal world. So we'll end this there and um, I'll come to the chat box because that will be easy enough to read out and honor your comments there. Uh, and we'll see what you said so I don't miss anything here. I think in the Sutta on the Noble Eightfold Path, the alcohol is missing from right action. Hmm, I think you might be right. <laughs> I think I've heard some kind of metaphor in a different Sutta as the mother referring to craving, as in the cause for birth. Hmm? The craving, as in the cause for birth. Could the section on no mother, no father have a double meaning about not recognizing the causes of rebirth? I'm not sure about that. I've never heard that, actually. It seems, I don't know, my first response is that's sexist, isn't it? <laughs> I don't know what the father is there. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's not the mother's craving that causes birth, so I find that a bit strange. Mother referring to craving. Okay, so mother is craving in the sense that craving gives rise to existence, yeah? Yeah, still a bit sexist. But um, <laughs> but uh, I don't know. I mean, I guess it could be. It's very hard to say. I've never heard that before. Um, I can't say I'm 100% on it, but the way that I interpret it that brings up more wholesome qualities for me is to think about gratitude to my parents, I guess. Um, I think the Buddha's generally not that ambiguous. Uh, so I don't know about that. Uh, and then someone says, it's nice just getting through the day better. <laughs> uh, bills off. Okay. All right. <laughs> so we've got another five minutes or so. So are there any comments or questions or things people would like to share? Felix? Can I move, please? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Hi. Hi. 
thank you for today's session. It's really, yeah, it brings me a lot of wonderful things, actually. Oh. Um, yeah, I had a question. Um, it seems to me uh, in the suttas you read that bad person uh, bring only bad things or yeah, calamities, all that kind of thing. And that maybe um, it's not really uh, wholesome to associate with this person. But then I was wondering if bad persons uh, only hang with bad persons and good yeah. persons only hang with good persons, yeah. how can good person become better person? <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, for yeah. me, I have like the impression that um, in my life, there was a lot of good person um, that, for example, um, brought the Dhamma in my life and helped me to become a slightly better person uh, each day with practice. So I was wondering, how can this be done if a uh, good person only are with good person and bad right, with bad? Right, right. <laughs> well, first of all, I like to say that I do believe you are probably always a good person. <laughs> and uh, as I say, you know, bad person doesn't mean somebody's like this terrible evil person. I think it's more talking about certain qualities in this context and the Buddha's using this just to contrast the extremes, you know. Most people are a mixture of all of it. Right. At times our conduct is positive, at times it's not so skillful. And um, it's just to really notice when which is which and what is which. Right. So it's more to do that, I think, than to really say that this bad person is like bad through and through and irredeemable and not to be associated with at all. But I do think it's quite a nice um, uh, reminder that if we just hang around with those people all the time, then we might start losing our energy you know we might start seeing that our own good qualities weaken we probably won't become evil and you know maybe they're not evil but it won't be that wholesome if that's the only company we keep so to me it's always a matter of um knowing when to resource myself and who i want to have close who i would like to live with for example you might not want to live with the people that you maybe serve at a drug rehab or you know if you're a psychologist you might want to not live with your clients because it would be too difficult right but when you're around the good people you can then have a much more positive effect on those who are struggling those who maybe don't always act in the right ways so i think you know although it's written in a sort of pretty black and white way it's for us to fill in the gaps in a sense and perhaps for us to just be able to define uh what's good and what's less helpful on the path a bit like the suttas that talk about two kinds of thoughts it's not like every thought is going to fall neatly into one of the other category but you can generally tell if the thought is more infused with meta than anger or more infused with anger than meta you know most often it's a bit gray so I don't know if that helps, but I think it's really important to um, to to share whatever goodness you have in your life with people who are struggling. Absolutely. But just to resource yourself as well. Yeah. <laughs> it does help. Thank you. OK, great. And we'll come to Kim and then finish off. Kim, may you on the note, please? Yes. Um, yeah, I just want to explain my comment about uh, it's nice just getting through the day better. Um, because you were talking about, um, I can't remember exactly what you said, but um, about believing in the possibility of enlightenment because, you know, well, why are you practicing if, if, if that's not a possibility? Well, I don't really think it's much of a possibility for me, but uh, it really is. It really does. The practice does help me just to get through the day. That's, uh, yeah. that's what that was about. It was yeah. all sort of out of when you came to it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, just to go back to the sutta, it doesn't actually say you've got to believe it's a possibility for you, but it just says that you know part of right view is believing that there are such people in the world that have realised the truth. And I mean, you might not have met them, you might not necessarily believe it, but at least we know there are good people, right? And that 
you know, presumably you have some faith to come and listen to the Buddha's teachings and that's what's helped you to get through the day, I hope. Anyway, <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> you're quite right. I mean, sometimes it's the same for me. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Oh, can't hear. Oh, it's just because my um my sound comes in and out sometimes. That's what um Shirley meant. Was it Shirley that said she wishes I fade away completely? I fade away. I come and go, but I always come back. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> hopefully I've come back. And uh, anyway, it's my turn to hand over to whoever is going to say a few words on Dana. Okay. Yeah, Manoj. it is. Um, today's the discussion is offered on a donation basis in the spirit of generosity. Any contribution you are going to make is very gratefully received and will help to support Venerable Chanda's physical needs, a day-to-day -day running of the new Vihara in Oxford, and also development of England's first monastery where women can train towards full bhikkhuni ordination and uh, we will add the link donation into the chat box and other than the donation if you are capable you can provide a food dana to venerable by visiting the vihara and also um, there are several more ways to get involved uh, it's very flexible now by getting into a couple of whatsapp groups to provide food if there's no bookings made or you can volunteer for a one-off work in Vihara, you can contact team at anukampaproject.org and you can get into one of these WhatsApp groups um, if, you are, if you are able to do those. Um, thank you. And also, can I add, there are some events. Um, there is a one day practice with Oxford Insight on the 28th of January. I'm not sure whether it is full, but the details are in the website. And Ajahn Brahmali's eight day residential retreat in May. Um, you may want to check that um, uh, in the website as well. Thank you. Thanks so much, Manoj. That's really great. So yeah, the two WhatsApp groups are great ways to uh, be involved because that way you won't feel any pressure. Like we send the message to everyone if they say something needed and whoever wishes to respond can do that. So write to, could you just pop in the email address actually? That'd be really helpful. The one day retreat is with myself organized by Oxford Insight, but it is full. At least it's full in person, but you can come online. I think there's a few places left online for the day. It's about a soft mind, my favorite, one of my favorite subjects. And uh, we have a meta practice tomorrow morning, uh, 9 a.m. UK time, meta meditation for one hour to start the weekend off. Or if you're in Australia, it will be your afternoon, I think, or evening, maybe if you're in Adelaide. Yeah. So uh, meta practice tomorrow. And what else? There's a few more Rajan Bamali events coming up. I've been working on that today online. We've got a whole two weeks, so only one of those weeks is um, the retreat, but there's also some talks before and after, including one at London Insight. Well, London Insight have organised it. It's, um, yeah, I think it's already live, actually, on their page. They just put it up today, but they've gone out quickly and done it. So I'm giving you the heads up because some of you might be in England, so you might actually want to book for that before it fails. Uh, so go on London Insights page. Wow, some of you are so quick. <laughs> Someone already booked for it. Amazing. We only just discussed the subject this morning and one of my guests, they actually wrote that blurb. <laughs> Fabulous. Excellent. So um, if you are planning to come to England for Ajahn Pamali's tour, it might be worth booking on that. There's some others. There's a lot of other stuff that's on a donation basis you don't have to book for, so you won't miss out. We've got something at Oxford Buddhist Vihara, Stefana. I know you're from there. Oh, you're a member of that community. We've got a, a talk there as well. So we've got a few things. And also we've put ourselves up. I've put myself up for a dialogue with Ajahn Pramali around women, gender and non-self. <laughs> so that's in Oxford too. Um, I'm going to challenge him as best I can because uh, it's good to do that sometimes. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, the audience can participate as well. So we have a few things. Great. Thank you for putting all that up. And I guess next week there'll be another class, Wednesday chanting as well. Yeah. Thank you.
Thank you so much, everybody. Do you want to wave goodbye? Would you like to meet my guests first? Would you like to meet my guests? Are you happy to meet everyone? Okay, these are two lovely guests who came this evening. This is Chloe and uh, George. I don't know why I keep forgetting your name. Terrible. And this is Leah, and she's with me for the whole week. <laughs> Great. So they were part of this session as well. Oh, yeah, Adrian lived with Chloe. Yeah, Adrian's here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Lovely. Good. So we'll unmute you, and if you wish, you can wave goodbye. <laughs>